hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm here, as always, Austin Peterson with my co-host, Landon Mance, and we are happy to have with us on the show today, Ryan Tansom of Arcona. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, you guys, for having me. It's fun being on the other side of the table. Yeah, yeah, we've, uh, we've done a little bit of research, obviously, on our side and see that you've, uh, you've got your own podcast, and it looks like you've got more episodes under your belt than we do. So don't judge us too much on, uh, on our ability to host a podcast. No judgment here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so give us a little bit of background. We like to start by having our guests tell us a little bit about themselves personally. We talked a little bit before we started about your family, so I know there's some information there, but, you know, background on your family, marriage, those sorts of things, and then uh, kind of how you got to where you are today. Uh, so I have a wife and twin girls that are four, which keep me on my toes <laughs> more than the, more than some of the business uh, journeys I've been through. Um, yeah, and uh, been with my wife for almost 16 years now, um, and grew up in a family business. I don't know how much you want me to get into that story, but I uh, grew up in a family business from the, my dad grew up from the ground up. Sold it back in 2014. Um, I had uh, helped with a, effectively a turnaround for five, six years. Was running the business, was help help sell it, um, and went through a lot of craziness. And over the last six years, I've spent almost every waking minute besides being a parent, uh, learning about this whole world of valuations, value growth, and by some of the stuff that we'll talk about today. Yeah, no, that's exciting, and I'm sure you and Landon will have plenty to talk about in terms of. Uh, parenting twins and maybe you can give him some uh i'm still looking advice. For maybe advice, you, maybe you can't i don't know <laughs> yeah, i don't know <laughs> if you're looking for advice on that front you might survival has been my 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 first and foremost strategy <laughs> but uh it's all good man the only piece yeah. of advice i have is get them on a schedule that's about all i've learned so far in sync there's a you sync them up baby wise is the the method that we use <laughs> oh. Yeah, see, and, I, and I'm telling you that the first that thought that came to mind for Landon there was Lance Bass. You know, you said in sync, and he he goes directly <laughs> to that. So, uh, <laughs> good one, good one. <laughs> I want to see the dance later, but maybe we don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah, oh, I always I, make time for that. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's how he closes every episode. Bye, bye, oh, bye. No. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, you, you actually talked a little bit about uh, the family business and, and helping with, you know, turning around and selling the family business. And I'm sure our listeners would love to hear about that. Um, just so our listeners know, kind of give us some background on Arcona first, what it is that you guys do day to day, and then and then take us into that uh, story of helping your family turn around the business. Yeah. And, and I think there's even a, a lot of stories that, you know, the last six years from the guests that I've had on that validate a lot of the research that we've been doing. It, it, so Arcona, as, as uh, what the company is right now, we do we have educational services on valuation, value growth, uh, and, and we have fractional CFO services. So essentially, before COVID, we had a two-day boot camp. Um, we have case studies of two people that two companies that have ten million in revenue, a million in EBITDA, and we do, we walk through. We created these five intentional growth principles, which we can touch on. Um, they are use it as a it's a framework to help people understand how to grow the value of the company with the end in mind. So it's about aligning all your strategies towards value growth, understanding how all the different exits could, ha uh, how they could all happen, how they could unfold and how to intentionally grow to uh, accomplish that. So there's an educational format uh, because of COVID we digitized it and we've been uh, doing the online virtual cohorts. So six to 10 business owners go through it. Also we can have people can do it individually, but as we were doing that and we were an education company first, and we can talk about why we got there, which I think is awesome about what you guys are doing too. And there's a lot of alignment there, but through the education first, we realized that as people walked out, entrepreneurs truly got it, which was a, you know, which is my main objective, which is to be able to articulate what they want and why, how to go get it. They needed help to do it. And we wanted to keep our business model pure as in like, we don't have a horse in the race. So we don't care if someone does an e-stop, continues to grow and acquires companies, sells to a third party. We're just sitting there helping them take the strategies, translate those into financials and take their visions and actually see out into the future how that, 
how their different ideas could impact the future value of the company and the things that they want. So two primary uh, business lines, and then we can talk about how we got there, but that's, that's the business as it stands right now. Yeah, no, that that's awesome. I mean, Landon and I, like you said, there's some alignment there. Landon and I's practice is, is the same thing. I mean, we, we serve small business owners, privately held businesses every day. And it's not about us telling them which direction to go or when to exit or how to exit. It's about helping them plan for whatever that looks like. Right. Well, and I think Austin, you bring up a, a, an interesting point and it took us a while to realize this. Like when someone says like, what do you wish you would have had eight years ago? And I mean, essentially I built the business I wish I would have had. And it's, it, it truly comes down to knowledge. I wish I would have understood these different things, strategies, how this stuff works. When I say stuff, it's about, valuations, value growth, strategic planning, private equity, all these different things. So that way we would have had more control over the choices we made. Instead, we had advisors coming in and out. We'd learn a little bit here. We'd engage one with over here. We'd, someone would walk in and say, what about this strategy? And we'd go, that sounds interesting. But then they'd walk out and I'd be like, no idea how that impacts us. Sweet tax plan, but like, is it relevant to us? I don't know. <laughs> so the, the five principles is a way to put a framework around this so that way even the biggest visionary or the most technical finance entrepreneur can understand how this landscape works. And it came back from that experience in the family business, which I'm happy to share with you guys if you want. Yeah, please do. So the, the, I'll try and be short with it. Is uh, My dad started the business back in the 90s, uh, selling copiers, bought a quarter million dollars of Panasonic used copiers, grew it up uh, to we hit 21 million in revenue, 115 employees, three locations. And truly like the sales guy, sales guy, it was like revenues coming in a lot of, what is it? Uh, lots of sales uh, hides a myriad of sins. Well, 08, 09 happens, the margins of the copiers drop out, it becomes more commoditized. You know, you, we have to make some big decisions and it was like, we just didn't have the context to say, okay, what is the, what, what do we got to do here? So we just knew out of pure survival that we needed to create a valuable company that I eventually could have. Like, I, well, the, we do, we have to do this for me, but also to have more choices. So we spent about six years, I built out the managed IT services, did some rebranding. We replaced and uh, rehired about 60% of our employees truly to have a B2B technology service provider that was competing with our competitors in the local marketplace. My dad and I, different, different ages, different timelines, different passion levels, different risk tolerance. I'm like, pile money in to build managed IT. He's like, I want money for my lifestyle, which by the way, he has all right to. It just was different, right? Based on our ages and who we were. We got to this point, guys, where we had advisors coming in and out, like didn't really know much about investment banking or private equity or, you know, just different things. And we just said, you know what? We know that there's five people here in town that all want us. This person would probably pay the most amount because of X, Y, and Z. We kind of did a little mini controlled auction, which we can dive into if you need to, but um, sold the business and the, to the max purchase price, but it was a strategic roll up. So there was consequences that we didn't see necessarily in, with eyes wide open, which is redundancies in people, systems, all this stuff that I had reinvested in and created for three years essentially got shut down. And it was like, oh, well, that, we wouldn't have done that if we would have known that was the exit. We would have done different things. So it was just all about this, understand how the end results could unfold so that way you can reverse engineer your plan into that out outcome. And then we paid a bunch of taxes, a bunch of debt. And then all, all of a sudden I was sitting in a cube next to an intern. And I was just like, I went from running a company with all, like, you know, eight figures revenue to now I'm sitting next to this intern with a job. Like, no, thanks. I lasted a total of 60 days. So um, <laughs> anyways, they kind of got us to, to what we're doing today. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So, I mean, tell us about the end result for your dad. I mean, he's happy at this point. I mean, obviously it sounds like it could have gone better and been better planned, but he's moved on to the next stage in his life. Uh, yeah. So he's, he quote unquote retired now. He, and, and I speak a lot about the, the podcast used to be called life after business. Now it's called intentional growth. Um, then the first principle of our, the intentional growth framework is your drivers. What do you want from the business and why? And it sounds ridiculous if someone's sitting here going, well, I want money. Well, yeah, 
but I'll tell you what, I got 220 podcast interviews that say that's not it because I got people that have netted a hundred million bucks that have a chip on their shoulder because they wish they would have done things differently or they have no passion or purpose after they don't have their company. So like you have to truly identify what do you want and why I don't think he correctly went through that process himself. Hence the reason that I'm doing and either did I, by the way, which is why we're doing what we're doing now. And to kind of, it's an interesting point to your uh, question, Austin, is that if you were to look in a vacuum of with most advisors, was that an optimal deal? Everybody would go, oh my God, yeah, maximize your purchase price, how you did things, how everybody would say, yeah. But then I would say, and I would agree with you. However, we didn't know all of the other options. So we picked door one without getting any options to pick door, you know, one through 10. So what happened was, is that it's more of like, on, you know, the, the basis of education is the more you know, the more choices you have. And that's kind of why we're at here is like, so to answer your question, Austin, I'm, I'm happy the way things went like unfolded, but the, there's thousands of things we could have done in, as alternatives, not to say that whether they're better or not, it all depends. What do you want and how, the, how does that impact the financials? Yeah. Yeah. I got a question, Ryan, real quick, just before we move on from this. So just so we're clear, our listeners are clear. So did you and your dad facilitate the transaction, the exit yourselves, or did you guys have an investment banker or some kind of exit specialist that helped you? We did not hire an intermediary. So we did not have an investment banker or broker that facilitated. We did not do what is called a controlled auction where you pin a bunch of people against each other. So investment banking is usually above a million in EBITDA where they're going out strategically finding private equity, strategic buyers. They build a SIM deck. They go auction you off. Brokers are more of listings. It's more like a real estate agent model. We didn't do either of those. Um, we had an m and support kind of M&A attorney and a CPA, neither of which communicated, collaborated, or did anything proactive, not necessarily their fault because they didn't know that this was happening, which again, a lot of people, if there are people are listening in, don't ever go to your advisors and say, hey, I have an LOI, like way too late. Everything's way too late. <laughs> your tax planning, your wealth strategies, the legal structure, everything's too late. So it wasn't their fault, but to, to your question, Landon, is we did it together to a, like my dad and I, like I went in there as the naive owner's kid that just wants to have a job. They didn't really know that I was like, was running the place. So we kind of used a little bit of our father son dynamics to extract information, play people against each other. So I think by the, the, the nature of it was kind of like what an investment banker would do. Absolutely not even close to the skill set at that point <laughs> that if we would have hired <laughs> someone to do it. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and it, no. Go ahead, Austin. I, I was just going to say it, it brings up some interesting things that, that Landon and I deal with every day. I mean, it, you know, we, we send our business owners through and like you said, if they come to you with an LOI way too late, right? Yep. Yep. I mean, we, we want to be talking to, to our business owners five, maybe even 10 years prior to the exit so that we're preparing them for it appropriately and then we, we send our business owners through what we call the business exit readiness index to find out where they are in that spectrum, right? And the best outcome of that is that they are quote, it, quote unquote, rich and ready to go. And, and what I mean by that is that they, they're emotionally ready to go and they've got all the wealth that they need to live the way they want to for the rest of their lives. And then the business is just icing on the cake, right? And that puts them in the best position to have the best possible exit because they were prepared to go no matter what happened with the business. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think what we should do, guys, is let's, let's break through some myths that people have because I've done, I mean, I've spoken in front of thousands of people doing keynotes. And if I hear the common th themes that are, that are the same. People hate the word exit. They have a visceral reaction to it. Get it. Okay, break that out. This is about understanding value valuations and value growth, you have to understand when and how this thing's worth something. So this is truly like, if I have a million in EBITDA, what the heck is this thing worth to me today as the owner of this asset, right? Not to, like your house, you look up Zillow, you don't want to sell your house. Be like, Hey, should I put 50 grand into the master bath or the kitchen? Like 
you have to understand how this could unfold. So understanding that doesn't mean that you want to sell. So then let's go through and say, okay, when you say, well, why do you have to plan five years in advance? This is not about insurance or estate planning. This is about making sure that the strategies that the entrepreneurs are investing in are growing enterprise value. Otherwise, don't do them. Use the money for distribution. So here's a perfect example of like, when, when you, the, the main theme that we wanna burst through people's heads is shift your mindset away from annual income to focusing on long-term value creation. So if you're focused on how much can I make in salary and distributions and, and maximize my tax strategies on my K-1 this year, you're potentially sacrificing long-term value creation. So a, a perfect story is we had an entrepreneur that walked out of our material and they're doing 12 million in revenue, 1.2 in EBITDA. And the company's worth about five and a half million bucks. They've got 70 employees, total legacy play. He loves Tony Robbins. He sent 60 of his employees there. If he sold today at the five and a half million, he'd have to squeeze every nickel out of it to sell to a strategic buyer. They'd probably gut the company, ruin his legacy. He'd walk away with only two and a half million bucks after taxes and debt. And it's not enough. So he goes, okay, well, if I can go from 1.2 in EBITDA to 2 million, I'm going to go from a five and a half million dollar valuation to a 12. And then I'm going to net $8 million, not 2.4. And that's all possible in 36 months based on a five and a half, or I'm, I'm sorry, an eight and a half percent growth rate. He's paid off a million dollars in debt already. He, and the goal is if he can get to that 2 million in EBITDA, he can do an ESOP instead of selling it to a strategic buyer. Every single strategy that he's implementing with that million in cash flow right now million two is hiring out sales strategies, building out systems, doing financial budgeting, auditing, strategic planning, implementing EOS. So everything's going into that to go from a five or, you know, four and a half, five multiple to a six or seven multiple. Does that make sense? So that just puts everything into context. So that to your point, Austin, it is about planning years in advance. What ends up happening is people show up and they're like, I'm, I'm tired. I want out. Well, no one wants your half-ass run company. You know what I mean? Like they're going to, they're going to pay you for it, but it's only going to get X amount of value for it. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. So I think that's a good segue, Ryan, into talking about financial targets. So give us, give us one, two or three different financial targets and owner um, should first identify, uh, you know, keep an eye on monitor them and also measure them. So this is right in your guys' wheelhouse, obviously, is there, there are three that we talk about in our second principle. And the first one is your target annual income. So let's say it's 200,000 bucks. Whether Again, this is to meet your lifestyle needs. If it's 200,000 bucks, you got to gross it up to say, okay, well, what, what is this going to be? But if it's 200 grand after tax, okay, what the second financial target is your net worth outside the business. This is important because based on your net worth outside the business, it's going to impact the third target, which is the value of the company that you need. So the net worth is as you monitor that, then you say, okay, the third financial target is the net proceeds of the business. So that is as it stands today. And what does that need to be? So in that example that I gave with uh, that client of ours, if he nets two and a half million bucks right now, it's not enough. So instead of forecasting out, revenue or just revenue because obviously you got to do that and net income you're forecasting out your EBITDA growth you're forecasting out your value growth the enterprise value you're forecasting out your equity growth and some assumptions on the sale of a company so we have people that are forecasting out that two and a half million dollars to the eight million bucks that's what they're forecasting out not just the top line revenue or the just the enterprise value so the goal is to your point about the financial targets is if someone comes to that, let's say that that individual, some a big private equity firm says, we're going to give you 20 million bucks for the company and we're going to shut it down. That individual in year three can say, you know what? I know I can sell to an ESOP. I only need 2 million up front to meet my financial targets because I'll, I'll get my net worth up to 5 million to cash flow the 200 grand. Everything above and beyond that is just choices and legacy. And I don't want to do that to my company. So it's, it's about setting those three financial targets as a foundation to make the decisions as what you want from the business. 
So in your, in your experience helping entrepreneurs um, kind of shift their mindset, right? And, and look at this through a different lens. I mean, how are you, how are you getting them to do that? What are the biggest factors that are motivating them to shift their mindset from mindset A over to mindset B, which is this more long-term kind of value growth mindset? It's a good question, Landon. I think the, uh, the educational material that we put together obviously facilitates that, and that is the outcome from it. Um, but without, you know, having a selfless plug there, like, I think it's truly, it, most people do not understand valuations. Like, I can't even believe it. I mean, there was a guy that, I mean, he's doing 170 million and tons of cash in his balance sheet, and they're focused on top line revenue and net income. It's like, by the way, that's not what your company's worth. Like, and then you go through the calculations and they're like, huh. And, and I think it's this, if you understand valuations, everything gets into context. Like, okay, if, like, let's say Lennon, I was going to sit down with you. And if you're, if you're sitting across from someone that only is trying to optimize for that year, and I'm going to say, here's the deal, Anna. Let's, let's put in a $200,000 ERP, ERP system. Let's hire a $200,000 president, blah, blah, blah. If you're going... Dude, you just told me I'm going to spend 600 grand this year of my cash flow. No, thanks. And then they, it's because they don't know when and how they're going to harvest this asset. So they see it as like an expense versus if you can say, hey, by the way, you're going to, you, you can still make whatever distributions that you want because you plan for that, but we're going to reinvest that cash and it's going to, we're going to reinvest a half a million bucks. And by the way, you're going to go from a five multiple to a six multiple on a million dollars in EBITDA you just increase your company by a million bucks. And if people don't understand valuations or when and how they can harvest that value, they're going to be stuck in that annual suck the company and use the company as a cash flow mechanism instead of an actual asset. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I actually had a meeting yesterday with some clients. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and their daughters were in the room talking about what, you know, basically we were planning end of life planning for this particular uh, set of clients and what their life insurance looks like, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one of the daughters just happens to mention, well, yeah, we just, we just sold one of our businesses and gosh, darn it. Like there's, we thought this was going to allow us to retire, but after we pay taxes, there's like almost nothing left. And I'm like, well, did, did you talk to somebody beforehand? Well, no, I mean, we've, we've ran the business for a hundred years. We, we know exactly what we're doing, you know, to sell it. We knew what it was worth. So they sold it, but they didn't take into account anything else and didn't realize what that value gap was, right? We talk about that, the difference between your personal net worth and the value there and what you need to be able to retire comfortably. That's your value gap. They didn't know what that was. They didn't plan for it. They didn't seek professional advice. And now after the fact, they're looking for advice. Austin, it happens every single day. It happened to us. And that's where I can speak from true like pain is like, I mean, in that client that I gave that a story of their personal wealth manager had that company on their, their personal financial statement at 7 million bucks. And I'm like, first of all, it's not 7 million bucks. Second of all, if it's five and a half, that's still enterprise. Then you take away the taxes. Then you take away the debt. It's only two and a half million bucks. Don't worry that that entrepreneur already thought they were financially free. <laughs> so it's like, no. And, it, and by the way, my, my business partner says that they're the most powerful force in human nature is denial. So the people that are listening in going, well, yeah, I know I could probably get a few million or a few thousand dollar valuation. You're going to have to look in the mirror and say, well, my company is not run that well. What are you going to do about it? And it's just like the same thing of doing a health assessment. It, like usually hard work is the outcome. You're going to have to go to work out and run and do these things for this outcome. So I think it's just truly about reconciling with that first. Yeah. It, it's a hard pill to swallow. I mean, we've seen it hundreds of times over our career. You know, you've got these, these business owners that um, basically they run their company like a job, but then they think that there's, you know, it's just their job. That's all it's providing to them. And they're not thinking about what its enterprise value is and what it's worth to anybody else. Right? Well, I mean, we, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you just nailed it. Austin. It's like 
There is no right or wrong. It's about making a choice intentionally. So like there was a, uh, someone that I know, $2 million recruiting company. You're doing $2 million in revenue. If you're pulling in, let's call it half, half a million to 700 grand in cash flow. If you times it by three, because I call it the three multiple hamster wheel, but if you're in three multiple, pay tax to pay on debt, you're about a year, year and a half for the income. And people go, well, why not just stay up, keep working? And then they grind, 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 wake back up, 57, grind, 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 wake back up, 60. Guess what? You still have a job. At some point, your energy or your boredom is going to come into this play. But the pro- my point about this, this making a decision is, and I call it purgatory, where if you're going to do the $2 million business and you don't think it's worth 10 and you just know it's only worth this, save the money and then be a saver instead of blindly thinking that this is going to be worth $6 million at some point. It's the use all the cash for my lifestyle and have this, I'm delusional thinking that it's worth 6 million bucks at the same point. It's about just making a decision. Do I reinvest to create value or do I save to be, to retire? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I wrote a little article called It's Okay to Shut Down Your Business. And the article was all, you know, I, I write really short one page articles. And I, and this article said, you know, most of you reading this are not going to transition or sell your business. And that's okay. But you have to, you, you have to do this planning on the side here so that when it does come time to shut down your business or you get sick, you can't work anymore, you get whatever happens, that you're going to be okay, okay or, or somewhat okay financially for the rest of the time that you're, you know, no longer getting an income. So, uh, uh, Ryan, this has been awesome, man. And uh, we've got, we want to extract a lot more from you, but uh, if we can uh, just take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, welcome back. We're here with Ryan Tansom, and and we've already uh, extracted, I think, all kinds of information that any of you should be aware of, and hopefully you're copiously taking notes as long as you're not driving and listening to this. Um, but we uh, we appreciate the time, Ryan. We we've, I mean, what I've identified is that we've got kind of a kindred spirit here, right? And and you approach things the same way that Landon and I do. And that's not always the case with, with people who do what, what it is that you do for a living. So that's refreshing to see and to hear. Um, but let's just assume, so first of all, let me throw out a statistic and I'm sure this is a statistic that you're aware of, but you know, 80%, only 20% of all businesses that try to sell are actually able to be sold or, or uh, you know, are able to effectuate a transaction, right? And so if people realize that and then actually know that only 5% of businesses are ever tried to be sold, then you realize how unlikely it is that you're going to sell your business at some point unless you make some changes today. And that's a goal that you have in mind. Because like Landon just said, it's okay to just shut down your business. It doesn't have to be your retirement strategy or your financial independence strategy. But if you want it to be, or at least it's a part of it, then you've got a plan for it. So let's talk about what some of the exit options are. If somebody has a business with some enterprise value, they put in the work to get there. What are the options that they have? So, yes, I I want to dive into, but I want to comment on what you said to us. And is that like the, the, and a couple more stats on the, those numbers, because it, it, I think the industry, the exit planning industry and, you know, the advisors are so diligently trying to break through to entrepreneurs to get them to think like this. And the, the crazy part is, is business is the most amazing mechanism to engineer wealth out there, period. Better returns in real estate. With a real estate, you have a, you only, like if you bought a commercial real estate building, what you can only do so many things to increase the value of that piece of real estate. You can't scale it. There's no, I mean, like you're going to have tenants and rent and like you can do certain things, but that's about it. So I think yeah, those stats are unfortunate, but if the if people understand the things that we're talking about, their ability to manufacture wealth 
is real. I mean, they're the whole private equity industry does this because they know that. And, you know, professional buyers come in and they want to take what is there to grow it, to build the wealth that the owner left on the table. That's the reason people buy companies. So I think it's, there's, there's unfortunate stats, but there is some serious hope of, you know, it, it takes hard work. And the reason that you get rewarded millions of dollars is because it's hard work, right? Like you're going to be doing things that are challenging. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that people get some solid optimism that there are, so there's like some pretty cool things that you can do with the company if you, if you have the energy. Um, as far as exit options, Austin, to how we all know that there's a endless amounts of ways that someone could exit their business. So to set one ground, uh, ground philosophy here is that there are, when you say exit, the first thing I would say, what the hell do you mean by that? And are you talking totally sell done my job? Are you talking my ownership? So I think that the word exit should be eradicated from our vocabulary and we should start talking about ownership versus management roles. So if we distinguish between the two, Landon, if you're getting paid to be the CEO, COO of my company, you get a paycheck for that. You could also be the owner and we could be partners of this business. We have to treat those two separately. I don't, it, just because we're 50, 50 partners doesn't mean we both make a quarter million dollars if you're not working in a job. So we have to say, okay, this is how you get paid based on your roles and duties and responsibilities. Then we have this thing called ownership which is the, your percentage based on your percentage of equity based on the, the partnership agreement. You can exit that in a lot of different ways. Each of those are, might have different things. You might want to, when people are burnt out, they truly just want to get done with their job, but they might want to keep their ownership. Some people might want to, you know, harvest the value, but, but keep being a leader and strategic visionary of the company for the next 20 years. You can do whatever you want. You just have to understand how this stuff works. So, huge foundational uh, nugget that's important when we say now there are five major buckets that we categorize exits into. The first one is internal partners, family members, managers. There's an internal transfer happening. Second one is what we call acquisition entrepreneur. Uh, my friend Walker Dival wrote a book called Buy Them Build, um, which never started a business. He's saying you should just buy one, but there's a lot of people out there called search funds where they're, they're essentially betting on the horse. So someone that's going to go in there and buy a job, someone that was at 3M wants to go in there and buy, buy a company to then grow it themselves. Third one is ESOPs, so employee stock ownership plans. The fourth one is private equity. And inside of private equity, those are, they're essentially institutional buyers that are money managers and or family offices. And then the fifth bucket is strategic buyers. That's up and down your supply chain geographically. There's a strategic nature. And again, you can mix and match a lot of these based on your role and your ownership, but those are the five main buckets that I think are important to assess when and how do you want your money and what do you want your role and responsibility to look like? Cause then you can reverse engineer what you ultimately want. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. So maybe we, maybe we should have talked a little bit about, you know, value growth before we talked about exit options. So maybe we take kind of a quick step back. So a business owner um, is of the mindset that they do want to monetize their business sometime in the future. They don't really know what that's going to look like, but they do know that uh, they're going to count on their business to, you know, allow them to be financially independent or free or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, going back to your point about value growth, um, help us understand, you know, what, what are some things that these, that these owners need to be looking for? What are some things that they can do, some tangible things that they can do to increase their value? I think you talked about the eight functional areas, you know, the value drivers. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, and I think you give a, a good point. And I'll, it's funny, I'll actually challenge you a little bit. The reason we have increased values principle four is because principle one is what do you want? Principle two is your financial targets. Principle three is the exit options. Because by the time people get there, you guys, then they go, I get it. Like I've set, I like, I get it. I understand valuations. I don't want to do an internal transfer. I don't want to do a strategic. I want to do an ESOP. Then they go, how do I get that? So 
it's about knowing this. Again, you don't have to sell, but you have to understand how the story can unfold in order to build your plan. So, it, and I think there's the reason that we, because we honestly went back and forth about that same exact topic, Landon, when we were building out our framework. And the challenge is, is like, and I'll give my example when we sold, how valuations are different based on the exits. And what we would have done would have been different if we would have known and prioritized a certain exit. So like my, that story I gave, the gentleman that's going to be building out his EBITDA to 2 million to do an ESOP, that's one outcome of how his strategies are going to help him accomplish that ESOP versus if you're only going to drive towards a strategic sale, some of your strategies might be a little bit different. So another foundational um, piece I, I think is, is crucial is I think this world of valuations is intimidating for business owners who are not financial. I just got off a, a huge, um, I was on a panel and there was like 20 business owners in there. And one guy's like, I don't know what EBITDA means and it's okay. And so to, to simplify valuations, we have, I, I've, my, uh, Pat and I have bucketed into uh, intrinsic value and transaction value. So intrinsic value is the value of your company today based on the risk of the cash flow. They called it the discounted cash flow methodology. Scratch that if you don't even want to, you know, grab that in your memory. Based the risk based on your cash flow. There's there's a certain rate of risk that people are going to apply based on the fundamental uh, operations of your company. Then there's transaction value, which essentially is when a buyer and a seller exchange hands, there's a purpose of the deal, right? So they start out at this financial valuation and then, then there's the, hey, by the way, synergistic values, placing a premium on it. Well, maybe if we're going to do the family, the family transition, we're going to discount it with the IRS based on a lack of control and lack of uh, minor, or, and minority share. It started at the, the financial valuation, but like there was a premium or a discount applied to it based on the exit option, right? So now you start to see how these things all line together. So in, if someone is intentionally growing to sell to their employees based on the, the intrinsic value, they're going to say, you know what, we need to make our cash flow more sustainable, predictable, and transferable. Therefore, we're going to need to place management team. I mean, they're in the process of hiring out six figure uh, management team, putting in phantom stock plans towards value growth systems, ERP systems, doing audits and reviews, building up financial forecasting. They're implementing EOS. They're implementing strategic planning, all of these things to make the cash flow more sustainable predictable and transferable in our, you know, to give you an example of how that might apply to my old business, our industry was changing from copiers and manage it or manage print to manage it. It costs us millions of dollars to reinvest in manage it. We sold to a third party that didn't value those. So we didn't get the reward of those couple million bucks. However, if we were going to do an ESOP or if I would have bought it, we would have needed that to compete in the marketplace to make that cash flow more transferable and sustainable. So you, when you think about your exit option, you want to say, okay, well, like we have a, a, a client that he's got about a $700,000 Salesforce implementation on the table. And he's like, you know what, if I do an ESOP, I have to do that. And I will get the value of that when I do the ESOP. But if I sold to a third party, they're going to just take all of our systems and, shut them down. So you can build sustainable cash flow, but the closer you get to that eventual transaction of those exit options, you start to make the strategic decisions in context to where you ultimately want to be. Well, I'll tell you what, I've made an entire career on challenging Landon. So you're welcome to challenge Landon anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we're going to chalk that one up to Ryan one Landon zero. But I, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a, <laughs> that's where we started with though. I mean, that's truly where we started with. Everybody wants to go towards strategic planning and growing. And I'll give you guys an awesome analogy that I've stuck with. So Simon Sinek's new book, uh, the infinite game, he talks about entrepreneurs always talk about where they're going. So, or how they're going to get there. So if I said, Landon, you're going on vacation. Where are you going? And you're going to say on a plane. No, I said, Landon, where are you going on vacation? You're like, Oh, first class. No, Landon, where are you going? No, I'm <laughs> getting in an Uber, going to the airport. Then I'm flying in first class. I'm saying, where are you going? Somewhere warm, warm. Okay. Like we all talk about scale, 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 grow, grow, grow. 
we're constantly talking about how we're getting there. No one has built a framework to say, where the heck are you planning on going? What does success look like? So you have to understand and articulate that to then say, should we take a bus, plane, car, should we bike? I mean, then you can start optimizing the path to get there. Yeah, and I, I feel like I say this on almost every episode, but it, it goes back to Stephen Covey's, you know, begin with the end in mind, right? And and if you do that, then you're you're getting, putting the pathway together, putting the steps together becomes easier. So you're you're doesn't mean it's not right. hard work. It's just you like I'm a, I'm a proponent of hard work, but like I'd like to know why I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, so listen, we've got these listeners who are listening to these things and, you know, you say ESOP and they say, huh, right? And, and you did go on and say employee stock ownership plan. So they, they understand what that means and so forth. But, you know, you've, you've thrown out all these different things that they that need to be done to increase the value of the, of the corporation plan for what, you know, the exit option is going to be all those sorts of things. But nobody knows how to get started, right? And or very, I should say very few business owners know how to get started. So how do they start, right? Like they, yeah, they've got to have a team of advisors around them. So how do they go out and find the right advisors to help them specifically for their business? Um, so there's two questions there that I think are important. One is that how do you get started? And the other one is how do you, how do you most effectively use your team? So the team of advisors is our fifth principle. And so to, to answer your first question, the last and I, this is truly an education thing. Like I, I, if people don't want to do the hard work to learn this stuff, some the, the story is just going to randomly happen to them. I mean, and it's more just however it unfolds, it's just going to unfold. I mean, I have too many people on my show where like it just randomly happened and some are randomly lucky, but more than often or not people, as they learn through their one transaction, they wish they would have known other things. So it always comes down to, I wish I would have known because if you think about in order to build a blueprint, you have to know how to build it, right? Like it doesn't mean you have to build it yourself. And I think going back to that blueprint example, it, advisors, and you guys are probably dealing with this every day. Like the owner, owners don't know what they want. They don't know how to articulate it. So then it's like you just throwing stuff against the wall, seeing that something sticks and it's all that you have left to be able to process so like, okay, well, you know, we're going to ask questions about this until we run into a roadblock or ask questions about this till we run into a roadblock versus the owner needs to take ownership over this. You don't have to be a financial engineer. You don't have to know everything about private equity. You don't have to know everything about these, but you have to know the basics of how they work. Cause then you can go to your CPA, to your attorney, to your wealth managers, to your investment bank and say, here's what I want. Here's what's important to me. Like I want 2 million in EBITDA. I want $12 million valuation. I'd like to do an ESOP. I'd like to, or I'd like to sell to a third party. All right, guys, what do we got to do in the next four years to get there? Let's optimize our tax plan or estate plan. Should we do, do different things with our corporate structure? It, you don't have to be an expert in all those, but you can at least get everybody marching towards optimizing what you've said is important versus different people giving different advice in different contexts and having no idea how to synthesize what everybody's saying, uh, uh, it, what everybody's saying as it relates to your situation. Yeah. And I, I feel like you actually just put that one on the T for me because the, the, the big thing that, that differentiates Landon and I and the way that we operate with our clients are two things. Like there, there are plenty of advisors out there that understand financial planning, the concepts, they understand exit strategies, they can help through this process. But the biggest differentiator that, that we bring to the table, and it sounds like you do the same thing, is we ask a lot of really, really good questions to get to what, the, what is truly most important to the business owner. And then we follow up by then, okay, we've identified where we're going and we become the catalyst to get it done, mm -hmm. right? And so we become that quarterback of the team that says, yeah, it's important that you have a legal advisor. It's important you have a tax advisor and a banker and a broker, you know, or whoever it is yep. to help facilitate that. But we're going to make sure that you get it done and it gets done the way that you want it done. I had, a, I had an M&A attorney on our, on our podcast and he goes, he's a great M&A attorney. He's like, 
it's not my responsibility to understand what they net, whether they're financially free or not. My goal is to get the deal done, the documents close, the deal structure according to the legal structure of this super bright person. And he would definitely help because he understands money, but it's not his, that's not how he gets rewarded. So it's like, it's the same thing with the CPA. I mean, their, their goal is to net proceeds, but like, is there risk or not risk? I mean, you have to have all these people collaborate. Otherwise your chances of not optimizing the, the plan are, are enormous. Yeah. And somebody has to drive, right? Well, and I think, you know, one interesting insight that I've gathered, Austin, is that the, in the exit planning industry that I've uh, gotten, a little, gotten some exposure to is that, and I don't know, I'm curious to hear about your guys' practice where like a lot of the exit planning industry came out and trying to certify all these exit planners, but like there are CPAs that know absolutely nothing about how to run a company or like they can do audits, but like that doesn't mean that you're making strategic decisions on hiring an executive VP of sales and how we're gonna design our comp plans, product pricing fix. Are we going different geographic markets? Or I mean, running the operations and strategic plan of a business is one thing. Optimizing the tech technical nature of corporate entity structures, wealth management, taxes, legal, is the outside kind of like family office perspective, but then the inner guts of the operations need to be, assess, but that needs to be, you know, put in the context of the whole picture. I just, I think there's a challenge where there's a lot of advisors that have never ran a business that are going in there and helping people with strategic planning. And I'm like, have they ever, like, I, I don't know if you guys have seen that where, you know, there's some, the, the difference between operations and our principle four of increasing value versus team of advisors, number five, where there's a technical nature of the whole setup. Yeah, I mean, maybe Landon wants to speak to this, but we, we have seen that. And I, I've been doing this for 20 years, but throughout that 20 years, I've always owned another business outside of financial planning that had nothing to do with it because I believe that it makes me more qualified to work with my business owners. We, we own and operate our own practices, right? So we, we, we operate those businesses, but they're different, right? I mean, I've got a pretty small staff. It's different than having this other company that I've owned that has 26 employees in different right. geographic locations, you know, so it's a completely different mindset and it, and it uniquely makes me qualified to speak to my business owners in their language and make sure that I understand what it is that they're really going through day to day. Well, you own it as an asset, right? I mean, I don't know if yeah. you got partners in it. I mean, it's, it's truly, you're, you've got this mentality because you're not in the day to day. You, you don't, you're not conf conflicting your role every day that you wake up with, with, the value of the company, which people try to, you know, you got payroll that in distributions and the value all kind of goes into a blender, but it's in, yeah, you're right. It does provide you with a unique lens. A unique lens. Yeah. And, and you, and you said something important there is I, I own it as an asset and, and all business owners own their business as an asset, whether they realize it or not. Right. Because <laughs> it is an asset. It is an investment. And, and we talk a lot about how, gosh, you know, most of your personal wealth is tied up in this one asset. I mean, if you owned 80% of your personal wealth or more just in Tesla stock, would you be worried? Of course you would, right? You're overexposed to one particular stock. You're doing the exact same thing in your business. You got to make sure that you're trying to offset that in other ways and prep for the monetization of that or turning it into a cash asset that you can then redeploy somewhere else. What's interesting is you think about your guys' the world of assessing someone's net worth, you're taking the net proceeds of the current value of that company into the context of your personal financial statement. And I, you know, it's interesting. I had this one guy, he said, well, he got an Audible offer for like 27 million bucks. And he's like, yeah, I can just ring it. And I can, I won. I, if I sell, I won. And I said, Dave, you've already won. You own that company and that's truly what it's worth. You just happen to have all your wealth locked up into it. So if you were a family office investor, would you buy that business? Yes. He's like, look at the growth and the future potential. But great. Would you own, would you want all of it, all of your net worth tied into that? Well, maybe only half. Well, they could, maybe we need to figure out how to divest of a third to half of the business then. I mean, you start to look at it from your guys' lens and make those decisions versus thinking that the only way to quote unquote win is to sell the thing whole outright, which you have, you know, that's your worth today. They just can't see it because they can't log into their brokerage account. And see <laughs> right. The ticker symbol. You, you, you can't trade it from day to day. You can't do any of that. Sometimes yeah. you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Landon, bring us home.
Yeah, absolutely. So this this just came to me. Well, actually, it came to me about 20 minutes ago, and then I lost it. Now it, it came back to me. Um, so valuation, Ryan, um, as you are very well aware, um, valuing, valuing, valuing small private businesses, um, most of the businesses that Austin and I, the space that we kind of play in, we're dealing with businesses maybe two to 20, two to 30 million dollars of enterprise value. That's kind of the space that we play in. But when we do comprehensive planning for our business owner clients, a lot of times we're talking to them about the valuation of their company. But what we are telling them is, look, this is the range of value for your business. And for some of these businesses, we're like, your range is zero dollars to eight million dollars because there's a chance that you don't ever sell your business. You don't have any hard assets. Like if you just shut your company down, it would essentially be worth zero, right? So we talk about that range of value. So my question is, in the future, do you foresee a, a, a technology or an ability or 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 something? that allows business owners and advisors to business owners to more easily access information to help with valuations, uh, i.e. a- uh, Biz equity or something like that. You're talking about- Not a biz equity. Um, what's the real estate? Zillow. Zillow. Yeah, a Zillow, a Zillow for, <laughs> for business owners so that we can have a lot more data to go off of when it comes to selling or- you know, uh, in private, yeah, private I got company. some, I got some thoughts on it and like, I'll try and be clear and concise with this because of the lack of time, but the, I see a big tra challenge with that. I thought that like six years ago when I saw biz equity coming out, I'm like, Hey, look at this could be this. But like the reality is guys, is that, you know, if you have, so there's 6 million privately held companies that have employees in the U S they employ 120 million Americans and of them, 5.6 million of those companies are underneath 5 million in revenue which essentially becomes more of the three multiple hamster wheel. And so you have like only 5% of the companies that are like where you're at an EBITDA, bigger cash flow, bigger private equity ESOP world. Everything else below that is SBA business broker world. And the biggest bunch of BS that I have, exp ex have learned over the last 10 years is that when you do a business valuation and it's based on the discounted cash flow, all you're doing is assessing the risk of that cash flow. And if you go to a professional valuation provider or advisor, they're going to like the biggest, most important thing in that mathematical equation is company specific risk. And you know how much research valuation professionals do on that? Like, like none. And yeah, so 20 grand and they don't know anything about your CRM, your executive comp plans, your non-competes, the contracts of your customers, nothing. They're just going... And then they throw it again, a, a dart against the wall. And it's the nature of the industry because if they go to court, if they put their signature on it and they got to go to court for lawsuits, divorce, disability, you know, anything, they have to stand by that. And they don't know anything about the business. They know that they know the numbers, but so I just don't know how, you know, like biz equity is trying to do this and, and they're doing it all based on sellers discretionary earnings, which is how much cash is available for the, for the future owner. But that's assuming that that future owner wants to assume all the headaches that the previous seller is giving them, which is a job. And so like, I just don't know how you can quantify that like a house where you can do price per square foot. You can look at all the finishings, granite counter, all that stuff are filters in the pricing mechanism. So I just, other than the, the cash flow availability, which is what biz equity is doing. And, and you know, usually if you're looking at S seller's discretionary earnings of that cash flow, it's never going to be above a three multiple. So the best thing that I think anybody can do in, as in our fractional CFO services business, we put this matrix together, together that says like the zero multiple all the way up to an eight. And then you have, and you have your cash flow over the top. And then you say, as I do this cash flow and these, these multiples, what do I think? You know, if I'm doing certain things, you can kind of like, Again, the, the goal is to understand the range, right? Like, 
I'm assuming there are some big assumptions if that, that, that story got the 8 million versus the zero. It's probably some strategic unicorn that swoops in, perfect timing, in the perfect marketplace, gives them the 8 million bucks. But like, what are the chances of that happening? Is that what we want to bank the plan on or not? You know what I mean? It's, it's about yeah. what can we control in our plan? Yeah, absolutely. So as we press up against time, spend, spend a minute or two, Ryan, and just talk to us about what you're seeing in the, uh, you know, mergers and acquisition in that space right now, you know, just share some, share, share some thoughts and experience that maybe it would be helpful for us to understand. Um, I, I probably won't be anything revolutionary to everybody, but the, uh, I'd say industries that have been decimated have been decimated, right? I, I don't want to buy a hotel right now or a restaurant. I don't know if you guys do. So I think there's the common sense layer uh, that we have to lay on top of the industries. Um, and so I think that's one thing. And then there's the, cause there are, there's a lot of deals going on right now of companies that have grown because of the business model. I mean, COVID accelerated a lot of trends that were already happening out there. I mean, I've got people I know where their company double tripled in size in the value because of it's more needed or more like aware at this point, but in the overall, like um, in the overall industry, multiples are a little bit down. And, th and some of that's driving that is uh, seller or buyer is not able to do as intense due diligence from lack of traveling or getting on site. But it's also the banks that finance the debt behind the deals are not as willing to lend. I mean, we all know that the banks pulled, 40 plus billion dollars because they know that 2021 is going to be real hard for a lot of people. So I think that they're just a little bit more skittish to lend to the buyers. So I think that that just naturally pulls down the enterprise value a little bit, but things are still happening. I mean, if, if you got a good business now more than ever, it's been proven that good balance sheets and good cash flow is just that good balance sheets and good cash flow. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. And it still comes down to making good strategic decisions, right? Cause like you said, you may not want to buy a hotel or a restaurant today, but you may want to buy a community kitchen, right? And just let multiple only delivery, you know, delivery only restaurants make their food in that kitchen. You know, there, there's still opportunities in this totally. marketplace. There and always think, are, you know, and, and valuations is what is the risk? of the future cash flow and the uncertainty is factored into that price period. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Well, one, one strategic decision that could uh, turn out to be very beneficial for our listeners is to find track down and engage Ryan and his team. So how do people, how do people find you Ryan online? I'm assuming. The website, arcona.io, A-R-K-O-N-A.io. The podcast is out there, 220 episodes. Our online course is out there. And that's, that's where it all starts. It's just truly learning this. So you can do it yourself. You can do it with a group, however people learn best. But um, yeah, it's a, just truly about learning how this stuff works. So that way people can make their own choices. That's great, Ryan. Very cool, man. Well, we, we sure appreciate your time and effort to come on. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, this will be one of our uh, top rated, most downloaded uh, episodes. So thanks a lot for your time, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you. you guys having me on. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm sure we'll be reaching back out and asking you to be on again. I feel like our guests would be happy to have you on every single week. They'd learn so much. Careful what you wish for, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform.
I am so sorry. <laughs> for, sorry for what? Did you know oh, you were good? I'm glad you didn't hear it. You were, uh, I had started the exit. Could you not hear it? Oh, no, you started it after we were done. Yeah, okay. we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, I'm, I may have you stay on with me, Austin, after we let the other two guys go and make sure that's the case, because I had started it before you started speaking, and I can have you just re-record just your, your thank you to Ryan. So we'll double check oh. that as the other two scoot. That's how I'm fine to my end. I'm yeah. hoping so. i fine here too, yeah. <laughs> Good. Hey, I still have you recording because I want to make sure I get a photo and let you guys properly say goodbye. So let me come off the screen again and just ask you to smile into your camera for a couple of seconds. And then uh, I'll let you know when we're, we have some photos and we'll let you guys say goodbye. Hang on just a second, please. Thanks, Karen. You bet. Smiling for me. And one more. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Very good, Ryan. Great to meet you. Fabulous conversation. I'll let you guys say goodbye and I'll just keep the window open. Uh, know that in just a couple of days, Angie at businessradiox.com will send you a link to the podcast. We'll also have the video in there and I'm going to shut it off right cool. now. Uh, video 